Well, hey, how are we doing this morning, church? Good to see you guys. Good to be with you guys. My name is Rich. I am the associate worship pastor here at the Father's House. Uh, if you don't recognize me, if you don't know me, that's because I spend most of my weekends leading worship out at our Napa campus. Speaking of which, hey, let's welcome Napa campus, East Bay, Roseville, CMF, Church Online, Family Rooms, everybody outside of this room. One more time, let's tell them we love them. We love you guys. Thanks for joining us. God bless you. Hey, we are in the middle of a series called Pursuit based off of our most recent live worship album release. I hope you guys have been enjoying that. Um, a couple weeks ago, Pastor Dave, he brought an amazing message based off of the title track, Pursuit, all about living a life intentionally pursuing the presence of God on a personal level. It was an awesome message. And then last weekend, my friend, my mentor, my boss, Pastor Joseph, uh, he brought another amazing message on the song, We Open Our Hearts. Wasn't that an awesome message? So good. I think he's in the back right now, but we honor him. I love him. Uh, and it was all about how a vibrant worship life is founded on a heart that is open to and trusting in God. And today I get to bring you the next installment in this series. We are going to be talking about the song, Beauty of Your Holiness. And this is a song that I wrote and I had the privilege and the honor to sing on the live album. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about the heart behind the song, uh, why and how it was written. And in the midst of doing that, I want to take a look at a local church in the New Testament who kind of collectively became their own version of a Bible character. And as we're looking at this church's story, I want to draw out three ways that we pursue the beauty of God's holiness. And I know that that sounds like kind of a lofty, super spiritual thing, but I promise you, I am a simple man, and this is not going to be a complicated message, okay? All right. Hey, a little bit of a backstory on me. Uh, I am married to an amazing, beautiful woman. We have two awesome little girls, one on the way, actually, one coming very soon. And um, yeah, someone's like, all right, pregnancy. All right, that's good. Yeah, I, I'm 27 years old. I was raised in church and actually in Christian school. I went to Christian school from the time that I was in diapers till the time that I got my high school diploma. So that was really fun. One school for all of those years. <laughs> Super cool. Um, I, was, I was raised in church services. I'm, I'm privileged and honored to have parents who, who brought me into the house of God from a very young age. Um, all of you parents who are bringing your kids from a young age, thank you for doing what you do. As a kid who started in church at a young age, now loving my life with God, thank you. Keep doing what you're doing. It, it's not for nothing. God sees it. But, you know, I would, I would sit in the back of the room in the pews and I would color on all the tithe envelopes and do what kids do. And I kind of miss the significance of the services that were happening around me, but I do remember one thing. I remember the music. I remember the songs. I've heard a lot of church songs over the course of my life. And maybe you guys have seen this before. Our lead pastor, Dave Patterson, who is in Maui right now, by the way, getting some much-deserved rest. We love you, Pastor Dave and Donna. Hope you guys are having a great time. They sent us pictures late last night of the food that they were eating on the waterside by the sunset in Hawaii, so we said... Thanks for that. That's really cool that you guys get to do that. <laughs> but maybe you've seen it before. Sometimes Pastor Dave comes up, and in the middle of his message, he whips out the guitar, and he starts singing those old songs. How many of you love when Pastor Dave brings out the guitar? It's so awesome. He was a worship pastor for a long time. He knows what he's doing. He knows all of the stuff. And so I love those moments. There's a lot of great old songs out there. But I have to be honest, as a kid who was raised in church in the 90s, some of my experiences with the songs from that era are a little bit different. I think I remember them a little different than how Pastor Dave maybe remembers them. You know what, let me just, let, let me demonstrate for you here. Let's see if you, if you know what I'm talking about. As I said, I went to Christian school, and we had this midweek chapel service every week, which is a cool idea in theory. It's basically church in the middle of the week. We would have worship and messages. Honestly, I didn't really care so much about it as a kid, but it is a cool thought. Um, here's a song that we used to do. This was a powerful little ditty that we sang very often in Christian school. Let's see if you recognize it. <clears throat> it's a big, big house. With lots and lots of room It's a big, big table With lots and lots of food 
It's a big, big yard where we can play football. It's a big, big house. It's my father's house, yeah. Did you guys do the touchdown thing? Where we can play football, touchdown! Yeah. You know, true story, Pastor Dave and Donna had an amazing encounter with Jesus while listening to that smash hit song, Big House, and that's why they named this church the Father's House. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> that's not true at all. Again, that was kind of a Christian school thing, so if you did go to church in the 90s and you didn't recognize that one, uh, maybe you'll recognize this one. Every move I make, I'm making you. You make me move, Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. Every step I take, I take in you. You are my way, Jesus. Every breath I take, I breathe in you. Yeah, so there it is. Um, kind of a catchy melody, I guess, and good message. It's all about discipleship and following Jesus with everything, every breath you take. Kind of reminiscent of the old police song, Every breath you take. Less creepy. They redeemed it for the purposes of the gospel. But really, the emotional crux of the song, where it really got good, where everybody always wanted the song to go, and when it did go there, man, we could spend so much time at this part of the song. It went like this. La, 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 Yeah, and then it would just keep going and going and going. And eventually someone actually, they, they did a cover of that song. There were a lot of covers of that song. And they changed the la-la-las to na-na-nas, which really took it to a whole new level musically, if I do say so myself. <laughs> if you're here and you're like, I don't get any of these references. I don't understand any of these songs. As one of the worship pastors here, I'm here to say, you're welcome. It's because we don't sing them anymore. <laughs> no, they were powerful in their day. There's one more song that when you're talking about 90s worship music, you can't leave this one out. This was the big one in the 90s. Everybody knew this song. Everybody sang this song. And just a disclaimer, I like this song. I think it's a great song. I think it's a powerful song. So I enjoy it. So when I make fun of it today, <laughs> I'm not making fun of the song itself, more the way that we used to play it and sing it. See, musicians have this technique that we call modulation. And for whatever reason, this song became the constant victim of modulations in the 90s over and over again. Let me demonstrate for you. Let's see if you catch it. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. The mountains bow down and the seas will roar. At the sound of your name, I sing for joy at the work of your hand. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. And nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Shout to the Lord, all the... <laughs> and that's how it would go, too. That's exactly what would happen. If you missed church in the 90s, there you go. Now you know. We could start playing that song, and as a kid in those services, you could leave the service halfway through while they were singing that song, go out, eat some fruit gushers, watch an episode of the Magic School Bus, play around the Pogs, come back in, and they would still be singing that song, except they'd be up like, Shout to the Lord! Because they're doing so many key changes. And they always tried to sing it just like Darlene Check, and you should never try to sing it just like Darlene Check. It, it always reminded me of another song, too. This is not a worship song at all. This is kind of random. This is where musicians' brains go, I guess. Um, the melodies were so similar to another big song in the 90s. It always reminded me of this as a kid. Every night in my dreams I see you, I feel you that is how I know you go on. <laughs> oh, I was always like, 
My mom says I'm not allowed to watch that movie, but the song sounds a lot like the one we sing in church. <laughs> Always good to throw in some Celine Dion every once in a while. Yeah, I've heard a lot of church songs in my almost three decades of coming to church, and there's a lot of great songs out there. A lot of powerful themes and powerful declarations that we need in the body of Christ, some great songs that we sing. But I've noticed that for myself personally, I gravitate towards one particular type of song, and that's the type of song that invites God to come and do what only God can do. How's this for an old song? Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away, Lord, have your way in me. Yes, have your way in me. Now, what is that? That's a song that has a heart posture that says, Lord, I'm inviting you to come and do what only you can do in my life. Come and do whatever you want to do, whatever that looks like. And on the, on the day that I first started writing this song, Beauty of Your Holiness, I never set out to write a song on this day. Um, it was a season where my family really needed peace. I won't go into the whole story, but maybe you know that our, our oldest daughter, she's got some pretty significant health challenges that that we deal with every single day. It's, it's changed the way that we live life. And she's been dealing with them since she was born. And it's a constant battle with stress and anxiety and heaviness. And just so you know, we know that God is bigger than those things. We know that he's on the throne. He's bigger than those things. But it doesn't make the battle any less real. It's something that we have to come up against quite a bit. And so one morning, I just knew that my family needed peace. It was a season where this medical stuff was really kind of rearing its ugly head at us. And so I just sat down early one morning with my guitar and sat in my living room and I just started pouring out my heart to God and just inviting his presence because I know that the moment the presence of God shows up, all of that other stuff is chased away in light of the peace that he brings, right? And so I was just pouring out my heart to him. And during the course of those couple of minutes, these lines came to my spirit and they eventually formed into this line right here. Come and rest here almighty God come and rest here almighty God just a simple invitation for the presence of God to come and have his way in our circumstances and in our situation very simply, an invitation. And if you're taking notes today, actually, that's the, the first of our three-point message. Invitation. Asking God to come closer. I wonder what life would look like for you if you started every single day with this simple invitation. You get out of bed, and before anything else, you just take a moment to acknowledge God in your day. Just take a moment to calibrate your heart with him, to acknowledge that he's near and he wants to come close to your circumstances. And just say, God, I don't know what this day is gonna look like, but I know that life has a tendency of throwing a bunch of craziness and a bunch of a mess on me. And before I allow, allow any of that stuff to dictate how I'm gonna live this day, Lord, I invite your presence. I invite your peace to come and rest on my circumstances. I invite you to come and rest on my home. If you are the head of a household, this is an awesome prayer to pray over your family and over your household. Lord, let your peace come. Let it settle on this household and on this family. And let it chase away all of the striving, all of the chaos, all of the anxiety that life can try to throw at us. God, let your presence come. Let us become more aware of you in our lives. This is a great invitation. It could change your life if you just made that a part of your daily life. You know, that we see in uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18 that our lives are meant to be a progressive work. 
That the more that we behold God, the more that we encounter him in his presence and in his word, the more that he takes us from glory to glory to become more like him. He transforms us into his image. Your life was meant to be one of continually going upwards on the chart. The older that you get, the longer you live, you are meant to be more and more fulfilled and satisfied in life because you are becoming more and more like your Savior. He wants to take you from glory and gl- glory to glory. Now, did you know that God doesn't want you stuck in your addictions? That's not his heart for you. He doesn't want you sitting under that heaviness and that depression that you've been walking in. He doesn't want that for you. He wants to come in close and he wants you to have a lightness in your spirit. And he wants you to walk in freedom and in victory from those things and lightness and feeling the joy of the Lord upon you. He wants those things for you. That's his heart for you. But here's the thing. You have to extend the invitation for him to come and do those things. Now, the story I want to look at today, it all started because of an invitation. Because of one invitation, the church of Ephesus was born. Their, their story starts off in Acts chapter 18, and this is about 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. The Holy Spirit has been poured out on the church, and the early church is on fire. They're spreading the message of the gospel everywhere they go. All of the apostles and the heroes of the early church, they're being followed by signs and wonders and miracles. It's an amazing time to be alive if you're a Christian. And in this crazy point in history, the Apostle Paul first sets foot in Ephesus and witnesses firsthand one of the most famous cities of the ancient world. We've got some pictures of Ephesus here that I'm going to show you as I read to you about what ancient Ephesus was like. In the Roman era, Ephesus was considered the first and greatest metropolis of Asia. It had a significant harbor and highways that connected it to the other chief cities of the province and was a hub of wealth, art, and culture, much like in ancient San Francisco. It even housed one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Diana, or Artemis, depending on the Bible translation you're reading. Now, this was a huge temple to a pagan god that had been burned down and rebuilt seven times throughout history, each time reconstructed in a fashion that was larger and more stunning than the last. It was a place of worship. It was a treasury. It was a museum filled with some of the greatest pieces of art that Asia had to offer. It also provided a huge source of revenue to the popular occupation of the time, which were the silversmiths who crafted idols in the image of Diana. Now, needless to say, when the Apostle Paul sets sets foot in Ephesus for the first time, he has his work cut out for him. But he sets to work, and on this first trip of a couple of trips that he takes to Ephesus, he makes a few disciples. And then as he has to continue on to another location, his disciples make an invitation for him to come back. They recognize something. They were discerning enough to see, God, Paul is using you. And we don't fully understand the significance of what's happening, but we know that God is on it. And we know that we want more of this God activity in our lives. So would you come back to us? They extended an invitation to him. And look what happens when Paul responds to that invitation here in Acts chapter 19, verse 11. It says, God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases. The evil spirits were expelled. Now watch the progression of events here. Paul makes a couple of disciples. They recognize God's doing something with him. They extend an invitation for God to come closer. God responds to that invitation, and he brings Paul back to Ephesus. Suddenly, people are being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Crazy signs and wonders and miracles are taking place. People are being healed of sicknesses and diseases, and hankies are driving demons out of people. I just think that's amazing. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, okay, this is a great Bible lesson on the church in Acts 19, but what does this have to do with the beauty of holiness? That's what we're talking about today, right? What you need to understand is when the Ephesians extended an invitation for God to come closer, it opened a door for a revelation of his holiness. They extended an invitation that opened a door for a revelation of his holiness. And that's our second point today, revelation. God comes closer and we respond. Now, this phrase, the beauty of holiness, it's seen several times throughout Scripture. But the one time that I really want to focus on here is in Psalm 96, starting in verse 4. It says, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Now what we see 
in these first couple of verses, verses four and five, the psalmist is attributing God's holiness to him being unlike any other God. All of the gods of the peoples, it says, they are just idols. They're deaf, they're mute, they're worthless things. They're not gods. But God, the Lord Almighty, he's the one who created the heavens. There is no God like our God. In fact, this word holiness, it pretty much means God. It's, it's the best that we in our human vocabulary, in our human ability can do to try to convey the absolute bigness and splendor and wonder and uniqueness and the there's nothing else like himness of God. And holiness is not simply being like God. Holiness is actually an innate characteristic of who God is. And only God is holy. That's why no one else has angels flying around them day and night, crying out, holy, holy, holy. Let me tell you something real quick. I didn't say this at the other services. God is holy. There is no God like him. Let me tell you something. Some people believe that God and the devil are equals in this battle that's taking place for, our, for the souls of humanity. It's not true. God and the enemy are not equals. The devil was a created being. God is the almighty, the creator. He has already won the battle. He's already won the war. It's not even a contest test, they're not even playing the same ball game, okay? The devil loses, God wins, he is holy. Now, where does the beauty part come in? Maybe you've heard Pastor Dave talk about how we believe the prophetic statement for this year, for TFH, is that 2018 is going to be the year of only God. Only God. Things that we in our own human reasoning, our own human wisdom and ability, we could never accomplish by ourselves. Things that only God can do. You see, the beauty of God's holiness is that he can do what no one else can do. Only God can save a lost loved one. Only God can heal cancer. Only God can raise the dead. Hello, Lee Brooks. Only God can take an addiction that it took you 30 years to get yourself bound up in, and in an instant in his presence, he can set you free from those things. Only God can do for you what he did for me. I was a broken, hurting, angry, sarcastic person that was not fun to be around, and he came and he took me out of my darkness. He set me in his light. He gave me a joy that no matter what comes my way, now I know I'm standing on solid ground because my Savior has set me free. He's given me joy that endures and perseveres of years. I could not do that on my own. That is only God. You know, these only God moments, they are the beauty of his holiness at work before our very eyes. I want to give you a couple of quick snapshots of stories we've heard of people in this church getting baptized because they've had encounters with the beauty of his holiness. They've had an only God moment. Naya says this, after I encountered his presence, God ignited a real fire within me. Ever since, God has been healing me and breaking off my chains because I am his daughter and he has a purpose for my life. Come on, that's beautiful. Faith says, he revealed himself to me and I encountered his love and comfort. He took away my brokenness, my depression, and my insecurity, and he gave me joy and confidence because my identity is rooted in him. That is beautiful. Nick said, I encountered God and I was set free from my lifestyle of bondage and darkness. With God by my side, I am committed to undoing the bondage in my family tree, breaking generational curses, and I'm called to help other people do the same. Come on, this is the beauty of his holiness in action, church. And this is why this song, Beauty of Your Holiness, it turns from a song of invitation in the verse to a song of praise based out of a revelation in the chorus. And the chorus reads like this, be glorified with every breath. We will rise and worship you in the beauty of your holiness. You alone are holy. Now, if you continue to read the events of Acts chapter 19, you'll see that Ephesus goes on to experience full-blown revival. An outpouring of the Holy Spirit, mass repentance, mass salvation. There's actually an event where all of the believers, the recent converts to Christianity, they come and they bring all of their pagan idolatrous worship materials and they have a huge bonfire that is conservatively $4 million worth of uh, other idolatrous paraphernalia and worship material. $4 million. That is a huge sacrifice. That's an extreme display of turning from one lifestyle to another. Ephesus is experiencing revival. And their church, it only grows as time continues. 
We see that actually they grow to be conservatively 40,000 people in number. Although depending on the commentary you read, that number goes up as high as 100,000 people in a church. And they're doing great. And we see little snapshots of them throughout other books in the New Testament. And every time we see a little glimpse, a little cameo of the church of Ephesus, they're strong, they're thriving, they're flourishing, they're growing. But time passes and life continues. Choices are made. Habits are established. And suddenly we find ourselves a couple decades later And this believer by the name of John is exiled to the island of Patmos, most likely for his belief in Jesus. And while he's on this island, he has this incredible, supernatural, prophetic encounter with Jesus. And the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, is written. And during the course of John having this incredible revelation of a glorified, victorious Jesus with fire in his eyes, something interesting happens. It's been about 40 years in history at this point since the birth of the church of Ephesus in Acts 18. It's been about 30 years total since we've seen any mention of that church anywhere else in scripture. And suddenly they're thrust back into the biblical spotlight as Jesus Christ himself commissions a message directly to them. Look what it says here in Revelation chapter two. This is Jesus talking to the church of Ephesus. He says, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, And how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. So we see that with the passing of time, the church of Ephesus had stayed strong and faithful in their actions towards the Lord. They're upholding the truth. They're holding people to the standards of the word of God. They're enduring persecution for his name. On the surface, everything looks great. But Jesus sees through their actions and into their heart. And his message continues in verse four. He says, but in light of the the other things I've listed, I have this against you. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. Notice the, the wording that Jesus uses here. He doesn't say you lost the love that you had at first. He says, you abandoned the love that you had at first. This is not the picture of a married couple living in the same house and slowly drifting apart over time. I don't know what happened. It's like we just lost that spark. No, if you study out this verse, the imagery used here is one of divorce. You did not lose your first love. You left them, turned and walked in the other direction deliberately. This is very heavy language for Jesus to be using towards a church that is thriving as much as the church of Ephesus. I could just see the Ephesians responding with confusion, shock, maybe even a little bit of anger. Don't love you. What about all those things you just listed, Jesus? Remember how you said that we were upholding the truth? Remember those times that those guys who said they were apostles, they came in and we discerned and we figured out by your word that they were not and they were liars and we kept them out of the congregation for the sake of your people? Remember when we endured persecution for you? How could you say, I don't love you? Look at all the stuff we've done for you. God, I go to church every single weekend. I'm in a Bible reading plan. I'm actually staying up to date on it. I'm a small group leader. I'm on the dream team. I serve. I go to pursuit night every week. I serve at Adopt-A-Block. I'm on the worship team. I preach messages. I'm a pastor. How could you say I don't love you? Look at all the stuff that I'm doing for you. All of that's great stuff, and please do that stuff. But when was the last time that you just took 30 minutes out of your day just to be with Jesus? Not to do anything, not to be concerned about taking care of any tasks, but just to be with him, just to wait in his presence, just to abide in his love. Are you too busy doing all the stuff that you feel like he's called you to do? Listen, if the tasks 
and the checking of boxes and the going through of religious motions have become such a priority in your life that you don't have any time to spend with Jesus, you might as well set that silver idol back up because in the absence of love, serving God can become the very idol that turns your heart away from him. Let me say that again. In the absence of love, serving God can become the very idol that turns your heart away from him. I'm so thankful, though, that Jesus' message did not end on verse 4. He continues on, and this time, he's the one extending an invitation. And I love this because this next verse, hopefully you've put together today that the church of Ephesus, that's, that's you and me. Jesus is speaking not just to an ancient civilization, but to his church. And these next couple of words that he speaks, it's not him rubbing anything in our faces. It's not him pointing out our flaws. This is a plea. This is an invitation that Jesus is making to his church. He says, look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me. Come back to me. Do the works you did at first. The last point today is that you need a desperation to stay in the passionate fire of your first love a desperation for Jesus. This is Jesus saying, take a moment and be honest about our relationship. Can you acknowledge that maybe your heart has grown a little cold towards me? Can you acknowledge that maybe your heart has grown a little hard towards me? Don't you remember the days when I first saved you and you were thrilled just to be in my presence? Don't you remember the days when Reading your Bible was not about reading your Bible and just checking off a box, but it was about getting to know me more. Don't you remember the days when all you could think about was me and my love for you, where before it was all about religion and rules and routine, it was all about romance. Don't you remember those days? Come back, turn back and do the things that you did at first. Come back to me. Maybe you're in the room today And passion has taken a back seat to routine in your walk with the Lord. Maybe you're in the room and you've been experiencing and stuck in professional Christianity for so long that you've forgotten the height from which you've fallen. Maybe you've forgotten your first love. But today, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I want to urge you to remember Him. Remember the things that you did at first. Let me remind you for a moment of who our God is. Our God is not some ancient, out-of-date deity who doesn't know anything about our personal lives. He is a personal, affectionate God. Our God is not simply the sum of a bunch of moral, religious ideas caught up in an old textbook. No, our God is not simply waiting far off for us to claw our way into his good graces by our good works. Let me remind you today, church, that your good works did nothing to get you here in the first place. Your good works only served to show how much you needed a savior. It was your savior's good works that he did on your behalf because of his love for you that you were here in the first place. His love for you is unstoppable. His love for you is unquenchable. He is an all-consuming fire. He is the initiator of a passionate romance between a loving savior and his bride, the church. He will stop at nothing to have your heart, to have your affection. He is worthy of these things. All the greatest joys, the greatest pleasures that this earth could offer, they melt in an instant in the face of the fire of the almighty God and his love. It's an amazing love. And it's a love that he poured out for you, extravagantly for you. It's not simply a love to be received. It's a love to be reciprocated. Remember the things you did at first. Remember when he came and he picked you up. You were broken on the roadside. You were in your shame. You were in your guilt. You were in your addiction and your brokenness and your darkness. And he came and he picked you up and he set you in his light. And he said, no longer are you going to be that broken, lost person. I call you son. I call you daughter. I call you beloved. I call you mine. You are mine. Remember the days when it was, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I'm desperate for your presence. Jesus, I don't want to go anywhere else. I don't want to be with anyone else. It's only ever been about you. Remember. Remember the works you did at first. Remember the passion. 
And if you fail every test that this life throws your way, if you only ever get one thing right, may you never cease to burn with a passion and a zeal and a fiery love for the Savior who gave his life for you because he loves you. This is why this song, Beauty of Your Holiness, is special to me. I was sitting one day at my piano, and I just needed a reminder of this love. I needed a reminder of this passion. I knew that if I wasn't careful to guard this, it can become all about the ministry and the routine and the next weekend. So I was just praying, God, remind me of my first love. And this is my prayer for myself. This is my prayer for the pastors and leaders of this church. This is my prayer for anyone listening to this message and anyone who hears this song. These lines, Lord, fill your church with the flame of her first love again. Fill your church with the beauty of your holiness. It's not just a song of invitation. It's not just a song of revelation. It's a song of desperation for the fire of God to fall on his church again and for his church to be so enraptured in the fire of his love that they're desperate for him and nothing else. He's a holy God, worthy of our affections. We are gonna go into a ministry time here in a moment. We're not done yet. This is not the end of the service. I wanna honor what the Holy Spirit wants to do. As I was praying for this weekend, as I was praying for you and everyone watching, I got this picture in my mind of this heart that was dead and blackened and ashy and it had just a couple of little embers in it. I just saw the Holy Spirit come up and just, and the heart immediately was engulfed in flame again. And I believe that that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in some hearts and in some lives here today and at all of our locations and over the live stream. And so at our other locations, your campus pastor is going to come. He's going to lead you in a time of ministry. God bless you guys. We love you.